Well, I am um, very excited to be here um, for the June object lesson, the long awaited June object lesson at the Center for Art in Wood. My name is Jennifer Nava Milliken, and I'm the artistic director for the Center for Art in Wood. And um, if you're not already familiar with the object lesson series, it's a monthly salon speaking series um, in which the center invites someone from outside our immediate community. And we basically, or metaphorically, give them the keys to the permanent collection of the center and um, allow them to choose a work. And then the, the evening is theirs. Um, and they can um, lead the conversation in any way that they want. And um, we invite everyone to, following the presentation, invite everyone to, um, to take part in the discussion and throw out your questions. And, um, and that's what Object Lesson is all about. Uh, before we get started, I do have a few things that I want to mention about the center and what's coming up because it's been um, a little while or a few weeks since we've, we've said hello to everyone. Um, first of all, I want to mention that um, we will not be convening for an object lesson um, in July. And then in August, um, and I believe it's August 6th, is that right, Katie? We have um, our first in-person exhibition opening at the Center for Ardenwood. Um, so everyone in the Philly area, uh, you are absolutely welcome to come join us at the Center in Old City uh, for that exhibition opening. I'm not going to tell you what the exhibition is yet because you're gonna have to stay tuned with the Center to find out, um, but I will say it's very exciting. And, um, but before then, um, you can view our current exhibition, Tom Loser, please, 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 in person at the center on Thursdays, Fridays, and Saturdays. And also online, you can take a self-guided tour um, on the center's website or in the center's uh, programming space called The Woodshed. Uh, on July 15th, we're going to have an event on the Zoom um, titled, Please, 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 Philadelphia. Uh, it is a, a discussion with furniture designer maker John Lutz, restoration expert and connoisseur of early American furniture, Chris Storb, and the director of curatorial affairs and strategic partnerships at the Wharton Escherich Museum, Emily Zilber. So you're not going to want to miss that um, kind of tying in the themes of the exhibition um, and Tom's work to Philadelphia's deep uh, history and the legacy of furniture making. Um, so check in with us about that. On July 2nd, we are opening an exhibition titled Wood and Body Expressions of Contemporary Jewelry. Um, the exhibition installation opens in the physical space on July 2nd, uh, but the preview reception, uh, which will feature many of the artists from around the world whose work is in the exhibition, um, it will be held on June 18th at 3 p.m. It's a little bit earlier in the day in order to accommodate people who are east of the Atlantic. Um, we wanna make sure that we can celebrate them and, and toast them and talk about uh, the themes that are, that are um, raised in the exhibition um, and celebrate the ability to wear the material of wood on the body through these amazing um, works of jewelry. Um, always you can catch up with us in the woodshed at thewoodshed.org um, and um, keep in touch with the center through our social media platforms, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, um, in order to keep abreast of everything that's happening um, and to RSVP for future events. I would also like to, before we go forward, I would like to just acknowledge um, that the Center for Art and Wood and our gathering uh, is taking place in the unsurrendered ancestral indigenous territory of the Lene Lenape and Wigohawkin people who were and continue to be active stewards of these lands. Um, the Center of Art and Wood will work to uphold the center accountable and to the needs of American Indian and indigenous peoples. So thank you uh, for taking a minute to acknowledge um, that history and legacy 
here in our region. Um, so generally um, for object lessons and First Fridays um, in the last year, we've accompanied our First Fridays with um, a cocktail demo to get people's weekend started. Um, this time around, we've got a pre-recorded cocktail demo for you. Um, it actually takes place in my other home in Tel Aviv. And uh, we have the video all ready for you. So Katie, you want to set that up for us? Yeah. Thank you. Hello, and welcome to the Center for Art in Woods Woodshed. It's cocktail hour, and um, for May, we are going to be discussing uh, Neil Donovan's Walking Stool from 1990. This work is in the Center's permanent collection, and Kenneth Valerio is going to be talking, discussing it with us tonight. But before we do that, we're going to make a drink called Neil's Missteps. Uh, so grab a bottle of whiskey and some ice, and let's make a drink together. Okay, so those of you who may be familiar with Neil's um, walking stool, it has been in a number of the center's um, exhibitions, including traveling exhibitions and publications, um, most recently in Pennsylvania Made in 2019, which featured works by artists um, who were active or continue to be active throughout the Pennsylvania Commonwealth. And now we're going to bring a new life to it by um, our discussion today. And if you want to check it out, you can take a look at the center's um, online collection database, or you can take a look and um, add your own flavor to this walking stool by taking a look at the center's coloring book recently published in, um, in physical form, but also downloadable on the center's website. Um, okay, so let's get started. The inspiration for Neil's misstep, missteps was actually two things. First, I approached Kenneth, the object lesson speaker, and asked him what his favorite cocktail is, and he told me it's an old fashioned. Um, secondly, in describing his walking stool, Neil um, had mentioned that he starts with an idea and then begins the work and lets the pieces fall into completion. He noted that this is often inefficient with frequent missteps. But with this process, the joy of creating runs through the entire execution of the piece. Um, so this beautiful story about creative, the creative process, from experimentation to failure, mending, and continuing on, influences our drink today, and hopefully it will help that process along in each of your lives. So let's get going. We're going to start with one and a half ounces of whiskey, scotch, or bourbon, whatever you prefer. Um, I'm going to put that in, measure that out, and put that in our shaker or mixing glass. Next, um, we're going to go with hibiscus syrup. Now, here in Tel Aviv, um, the hibiscus flowers are everywhere. They generally look like this, but they close up at night. But they are these big, beautiful, red, um, vibrant, and voluptuous flowers uh, that can also be dried and um, used in teas or infusions. And they have a lot of antioxidants. And we just happen to have some in our house. So I made a cocktail simple syrup out of those dried leaves. And basically, uh, we are gonna post a simple syrup recipe here. But a simple syrup is just um, a syrup that's used in a lot of cocktail recipes, especially um, throughout the 30s, 40s, and 50s, and 60s. Um, and uh, you can basically whip it up by just adding a cup of sugar and a cup of water, bringing them to a boil. If you wanna add flavors or um, spices, or any kind of profile element to yours in the syrup, you just throw that element in as well. So during the boiling process, I threw in about two tablespoons of hibiscus flowers, and here's what we have. You chill it, it, it lasts for up to two weeks in the freezer or refrigerator. So I'm gonna measure out one ounce of the syrup. It's got a beautiful deep color. 
And then to balance out the drink, we're gonna add a half ounce of uh, pre-squeezed fresh lime juice or lemon juice, whichever you prefer. Um, a half of an ounce of uh, rosetta or um, in other places I think it's called orsha. It's an almond syrup. Um, and it provides a wonderful deep base to a lot of cocktails. Um, it's used quite a bit in our household. And finally, um, you can add your favorite bitters to this drink. I would recommend something um, kind of floral or sweet. I'm going with a rhubarb. Uh, it just depends on, on your taste. So we're going to add ice to our shaker. And then shake for a good 15 or 20 seconds should do it. Here we go. There we go. Strain it into a glass with um, a big ice cube on it or a lot of ice cubes so that it doesn't dilute and melt quickly. And then garnish with, um, you could use a basil leaf. Um, I like rosemary for this drink because it just adds a really nice um, fragrance to it that brings it all together. Now here is your meal's missteps. Let's enjoy the discussion. Relax and hang out everyone. Thanks for joining. So I've got my meal's missteps right here. And um, thanks for hanging out. And I've also uh, posted the recipe in the chat. So if this is something that looks appealing to you, you can make it in your own home. Um, now I'm gonna hand it over to Katie, who's going to introduce our June object lesson speaker tonight. Great, thanks Nava. Um, so tonight we have Kenneth Hilario with us tonight, who has, as I told him earlier, I love his shirt. Um, he is a former staff reporter at the Philadelphia Business Journal. He gained uh, firsthand ex expertise covering the hospitality, tourism, and marketing communications industries. From restaurants and cultural attractions to leisure and international travel, Kenneth has demonstrated a deep understanding of hospitality industries and their social and economic impact through his reporting. The Philadelphia resident graduated from Temple University with a bachelor's degree in journalism. And we're so happy to have him with us tonight. So Kenneth, I'm gonna hand it over to you. Great, thanks Nava, thanks Katie. Um, thank you everyone uh, for joining and thanks for your patience. I was very excited for last um, month, last month's object lesson. However, I received my second vaccination the day before, was not feeling that great the next day but I'm so glad that um, to join Center for Art and Wood for this month. And I'm actually really honored that they even asked me in the first place and I'm very excited. Um, yeah, so let's talk about it. So I'm gonna share my screen um, for a little presentation that I did. Um, so let's get this started. Okay. Great, oops, there we go. So when I first started talking with the Center for Art and Wood team, um, I told them that I was looking for items that had to do with the idea of traveling. Um, in the before times, before COVID, I traveled as much as I could. Uh, last year before quarantine in February for my birthday, I went to Nashville and then I had plans to travel more in the months ahead. Uh, the year before that in 2019, I went to Australia for the first time, it was amazing. Um, so since I couldn't go anywhere um, last year, no, none of us can go anywhere because of COVID, I wanted to examine a piece that had to do, what kind of evoked the idea of traveling. Um, the Center for Art and Wood team gave me a number of options, but it was Neil's walking stool, uh, influenced by his lifelong mentor, John Hanian, that resonated with me. Um, we'll get into the idea and inspiration behind Neil's piece later when we talk with him, um, but it resonated with me because I personally cannot sit still. I don't enjoy the beach because I need to go be up and exploring a new destination that I'm in. I don't know how to relax. I get rela restless. And there was something about walking stool that evoked a sense of, for me, a sense of 
the desire to move, to explore, to get out there and live life. Um, in the past year, we were all stuck inside. I was restless, you were restless. Um, we couldn't get out there to do what we wanted to do. The stools are designated for sitting, for staying still, for being stagnant. But there was something about the walking stool having legs. I felt like this piece, it wanted to move to get out of that place that the user, the person sitting left it in. I kind of felt like the stool in a way, um, in some ways last year and kind of still at this point, um, even as things are opening up again. Um, so uh, let me show you this piece, that'd probably be helpful. <laughs> so this is the walking stool, uh, 1990. I was a year old when Neil created it, <laughs> when it was finished. Um, I also like, Nava mentioned this piece, uh, this quote in Neil's artist statement. Um, it resonated with me also. I don't draw my sculptures and then execute the physical piece. I start with an idea, begin the work, and then let the piece lead me to completion. And I'm the kind of person who loves lists. I love organizing things. But when it comes to art, um, a lot of things in my apartment that I painted myself. Um, so it, I can tell people that all the paintings are locally made from a local artist. <laughs> but there's something about pieces where I don't plan out what I'm, the pieces I'm going to make. It's just whatever it takes me there, like whatever I'm feeling. If something does not what I had imagined, that's just where it takes me. Um, so I'm not mad at the creations that I make. Um, and so, yeah, this is what spoke with me, spoke to me. And I wanted to speak uh, with the artist, Neil, for this object lesson because I love hearing stories. Um, I love hearing the ideas and the concepts behind a piece, behind something someone created. Um, like I was a journalist, uh, like not, uh, Katie mentioned, I was a journalist before. I love talking to people, picking their brains about something, um, entrepreneurs, artists, something. Um, I wanna hear the stories behind it because that's how people latch on to an item and kind of resonate with it, purchase an item, want it in their homes. Um, so rather than talking for Neil, I wanted to uh, talk with Neil uh, and to be part of the conversation. Um, but before we get into that, I just want to show a few photos that um, Neil did, did send me some original Polaroids in 1990 um, of this piece. So as you can see here, this is um, the walking stool. Here it is from the other side, so you can get a, another view of it. This one. And then a little close up of the seating of the seat. And then here it is again, as it shows up on Center for Art and One's website. Uh, don't forget to visit them, see it for person and all their collections. <laughs> um, and so I will stop sharing my screen and get started on asking Neil some questions about the piece. So hello, Neil. <laughs> um, thanks again for, um, if you don't know, Neil was just hiking a few weeks ago recently and I'm so glad that it worked out that Neil could be part of the conversation. Um, so hello, Neil. <laughs> Hi, Kenneth. Thanks again for asking me to do this. Yeah, of course. Um, all right. So I did want to speak, um, just so everyone knows, speak about kind of earlier before we get into the actual the walking stool, to hear from Neil talking, hearing about, you know, his uh, how he got started into creating arts, and then talking about the piece itself, and then kind of knowing what he's been doing in the past year or so. Um, so Neil. When did you know you were destined to be an artist and who were your inspirations or mentors um, you know, in this journey? Sure, um, I, I think I knew as a, as a really small child that I liked wood and wanted to work with wood um, and no one in my family uh, had that passion. So I'm not sure where it came from. Um, I know that my father stored wood in the, in the um, in the floor joist that you could see from the basement. So as a little boy, I'd walk around and look up at that wood and yearn to make something, which I, I find fascinating to think that it's, it's almost as though a person could be born with a passion for a certain material. I know that when I went to the wood shop class in my junior high school in seventh grade, I walked into that space and felt like I had died and gone to heaven. And, and again, I had no reason to, I had no real woodworking experience whatsoever. I just knew that that's where I belong. So at the risk of sounding really artsy and esoteric, um, it's, it's just part of who I am and it always has been. Great. And so obviously there's so many, you know, materials that people can work with um, when it comes to creating arts. Um, how did you gravitate towards working with wood? 
Yeah, I don't know. I, I um, <clears throat> again, I, I sometimes um, get annoyed, if you will, with with um, folks that that uh, want to ramble on about an answer to a question like this. I just I just know that um, there's something. First of all, Woods Vary ex is accessible. You can you can work with it as a beginner, and you can work with it as a novice or as an expert. And it's it's very uh, it's friendly to work with. So. Um, it's, it's probably one of the reasons it's so popular with uh, retired people because you can buy just a few tools and start making things and they can be functional or they can be artistic, but um, it's very forgiving and, you know, um, you, you don't, as opposed to a, a, an oil painting, for example, I, I can't imagine um, the average per, or, or metal working or, um, you know, even throwing a pot. I mean, some of those things require expensive equipment, you know, a kiln and a, and a, and a wheel and, and, and knowledge that it's, you can't just enter into it uh, as casually as you can with wood. So that might answer, you know, how I was able to get started without any direction from family or friends. Gotcha. Awesome. And so the walking stool, as mentioned, um, piece from 1990, um, it's found, it's found its ways to publications over 20, including the cover of the original Wood Turning Center, now Center for Art and Wood, um, catalog of its collection. Um, can you talk about the inspiration uh, behind uh, Walking Stool? Um, yeah, I, I had the, I had a, a great industrial workspace that I, you know, made into my, my first studio. And in that space, uh, prior to my arriving was a, a was a company that made um, shoemaking equipment and they had old literally antique shoemakers lasts a, a whole variety of them and there was a big bin of them and at one point I think I threw most of them away that's before I did walking stool I just saved a couple and I, I looked at them one day and saw that these would be a great leg for a, for a piece of furniture and I just started playing with them and and uh, as, as you mentioned earlier my my process for for design is um, it's, it can be, there are many, many missteps as Nava just said. Um, but in, in, in this case, I, I made the two legs first and I, and I had the seat made. Actually, I think I made the seat first and I attached the legs knowing that I would need either a third or a third and fourth uh, leg and had no idea what it would look like or what it would be. And it's, I, I can't tell you how frustrating that can be to, to be in the middle of a, what seems like is gonna be a successful piece, but really hitting a brick wall and I, so at one point I was just holding up different things to, uh, you know, to make a tripod and just walking around and looking at it. And, and I just put a simple stick there and realized, oh, that could be a cane. And that's where the inspiration for the third leg came from. And once I put that cane there, um, just the, um, the attitude of the piece or the position of the piece, um, it, it had motion. I, I wish I could take credit for planning that and drawing it beautifully and then making it just, I was able to see it after um, you know, as it, in the process, I was able to see it as a potentially, um, you know, almost a kinetic piece. So um, I guess I, I hope I'm answering your question about the inspiration. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, so in your artist statement, you also say, so concepts keep coming to you, um, but I guess you look at Walking Stool as kind of your centerpiece, a signature piece of your career. Um, so you're still able to produce and concepts keep coming, but you said that it requ requires a lot of faith uh, to anticipate another such spark. As an artist, can you talk about that, um, that spark? Yeah, I think um, they're, they're gifts. I mean, the, the walking stools is perhaps my best example. I'd like to think I've done some other good work, but um, you, you just, I find, I like to sit in my rocking chair by myself, sometimes in the dark and just visualize you know, the possibilities of all the different things that I could make next. And every now and then, um, you just get blown away. Um, I know James Taylor, one of my favorite singer songwriters said, I don't write these songs. I'm just privileged to be the first one to hear them. Um, I, I feel that's kind of my relationship with design. Um, my my um, professor at, at IUP where I studied furniture design, uh, had an entirely different process. He would draw until he, until he came up with something that he liked. Um, I don't draw, I sit and visualize until I see something that I like. And you know where the where the inspirations come from, where the ideas come from. Um, I, I say they come from God. That means different things to different people, and we don't need to get into that. But um, I think it would be presumptuous to uh, to take credit for for the ideas. They just 
Um, they just arrive in my mind, fortunately. Um, how many ideas do you think <laughs> come to your mind? Like, you know, like, how does that, how does your mind look, let's say? Like, how, how many ideas come to you? Yeah, that's kind of hard to articulate. Um, I, I'll tell you about my mentor, John Vahanian. He, he, I'll, I'll compare him, I'll answer your questions briefly here, but um, Chris Weiland, who I studied with at IUP, um, you know, each design was like birthing a baby. John Vahanian, it's like a fire hose. The idea is he can't stop them. His challenge is to stop and do one of the ideas that come. And I'm somewhere in the middle, probably closer to Chris Weiland, where um, I'll, I'll come up with an idea and I'll be excited about it. But then as I try to flesh it out and, and consider its execution, you know, most of the ideas kind of, they die on the vine. It's, it's, um, it's unusual that one stays um, active and, and exciting and propels me to, to, to the execution. Um, again, hope I'm answering your question. Yeah, so um, kind of like, so everyone, when I mentioned how what Neil's piece meant to me, uh, that was the first time he heard that, um, kind of like how it resonated with me. So Neil, how, as an artist, how do you, how does it feel about like hearing other people's, um, how they view your piece, especially, you know, just the walking stool, just how I mentioned it earlier, how it resonated with me. How does that feel as an artist, like hearing how your art, how your pieces like touch people? Yeah, well, when people like it, it's, it's uh, you know, it's, it's wonderful. It's an ego trip. It's, it's, a, it's a joyful thing to have happen. Uh, when I walk in from the studio and present something to my wife and she doesn't like it, or she doesn't say anything, but, you know, it's pretty clear to me because we've been married for almost 40 years. Um, it's, you know, it's painful. So <laughs> if people yeah. like it, it's a beautiful thing. If they don't like it, um, it, I think it takes a lot of courage for an artist to, um, like and respect, respect's probably a better word, their work when they're not getting positive feedback for it. I know with The Walking Stool, my, the first show that I entered it in was the, um, was the Erie Spring Show, Erie Art Museum Spring Show, which is just a regional show, but uh, especially at that point in my career, getting in that show was really important to me. Um, and sometimes I did, sometimes I didn't, and my, the stool was rejected. So I came away from the show thinking, well, I, that kind of, I, I like this piece. But it, you know, it, it actually informed my perception of the piece a little bit to think that that juror did not like it. So um, I know that Albert's with us right now. I, I can't thank him enough for liking the piece because here we are 30 years later as a result of his faith in the piece and his appreciation of the piece. Here we are 30 years later um, still talking about it. Um, it's, you know, I guess simply to answer your question, um, I'm in heaven when people, I'm, I'm in heaven right now talking about my work. So you know, to think that, that somebody um, still appreciates it 30 years later, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a trip. It's, it's wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, for sure. Um, how, do you, how did you know when you were creating Walking Stool? How did you know? When, when was that moment you're like, it's finished? This is it? Um, it was virtually finished long before it was physically finished when I, when I held that stick up and I saw the cane, then, then the piece was done. And um, I actually physically finished it, showed it to John Vahaney and he said, um, and you have to understand, I, I, um, I didn't come from an artistic background. I came from a very pragmatic woodwork. I mean, I was an industrial arts major in college and I love, I've always made things, but I was not introduced to art until graduate school. And, and I say not introduced, I mean, I never had an art class in high school or middle school other than, you know, tracing my hand at Thanksgiving and calling it a turkey. I mean, I, I didn't have any art background. So when I would, I presented this piece to, to John Vahanian um, and he said, yeah, the legs are kind of clunky. What do you think? And I'm looking at it going, eh, I think he's right. So I, I, I made new legs and, you know, it wasn't like he drew them and showed me what to make, but just his, his comment was, was enough for me to, um, his, his constructive criticism was immensely helpful. The other thing he recommended that was because he had done these really fragile pieces and shipped them all over the world. He said, make it so that the legs will screw into the seat so that you can ship it safely. Um, I actually, the first time I shipped the piece was to Aramont, you know, right after I made it, I was in a show at Aramont and it came back all smashed up. And, and so at, at that point, it was a no brainer. I, I had to repair it. I might as well do it in a way that 
allowed it to be assembled and disassembled easily. And John also showed me how to make the crate for the piece, which um, I'm, I'm guessing is probably some of the inspiration for Albert to have the piece to travel because he knew it would be safe in that crate. Um, it was a well thought out crate uh, because John made it. So, so uh, as you mentioned, uh, walking stool 30 years later, um, the piece that continues to have life. Um, how has your relationship with walking stool changed in the 30 years? Because um, I imagine like even when I'm doing something like even as I like rework furniture in my apartment, then my relationship with how things look changes like even weekly. So I'm just wondering like when you're creating things, especially the walking stool, how has your relationship changed, your view on it, your... Yeah. Yeah. Well, again, I mean, there none of none of the pieces I've done in my life have had near the exposure that the, this piece has had. So let's go back to that first show. It was rejected. I had a relationship with it, not so positive at that moment. Um, when Albert bought it, certainly, or I should say, when Albert recommended the purchase for the for the organization, um, you know, I I had you know a lot more respect for the piece certainly in that moment. But again, then there's been a couple of weird things um, that have happened with the piece. Wonderful weird things. I'm a high school student in the Philadelphia area, saw it at the Philadelphia airport in an exhibition at one point years ago, and he made the stool. He did his best to copy the stool, um, you know, which from an art standpoint is a no-no, but from, uh, from an ego standpoint, it was awesome. His dad sent me a photograph of, he said, I hope you don't mind, my son made your stool. And I said, well, what, it took me a few minutes to understand even what was happening, but you know, I, I did my best to write an encouraging letter to the kid. And, but I was thinking this must be what it's like to write a song and hear it on the radio, obviously on a much smaller scale uh, in my case, but um, you know, to think that someone out there that you've never met is appreciating something that you've done is one thing, but to get some feedback from a complete stranger is a whole nother level. So, so my relationship with the piece has, has been, it's been all positive. Um, other than the fact that it's it's a little um, frustrating and humbling to think that here's a piece that I made um, when I was 30, and I'm I, I feel a little bit like and I hope, hope Paul McCartney's not listening, but I mean I feel like he wrote all those incredible songs as a young man, and we don't hear any great Paul McCartney songs anymore. I, so the the inspiration or the the um, I can't remember what words I used or that you used just now, but the the idea that um, I might make an, a, another piece that has, is, is, is as successful as a walking stool has been. Um, it's, it becomes less and less likely as I age. So um, anyway, I'm kind of rambling here. No, it's like, oh my God, when you're 30. Okay, so when you made this piece, I was one, I, still in the Philippines. And now I'm just like rethinking my life. Like, what have I done? <laughs> I've done, in 30 years, am I going to have like a piece that's in Center for Art and Wood, but you know, something like that. But that's really amazing, especially just thinking about like, I just can't imagine like what it'd be like for you, for an artist to have a piece made in one specific year. And then through the generate, like through the years, someone that was like one or just born, not even born yet, maybe can still kind of um, resonate with the, the item. Um, kind of like standing the test of time, like it's timeless doesn't, you know, it's, I don't know what it feels for you. Um, but yeah, it's something like that where it's like things, if things resonate, it doesn't matter what time frame, what time era they're made in. Yeah, the well, I, I, I can tell you how I feel. It's, it's, um, it's humbling. You know, I didn't, I, I never really assumed, and I hope I'm not being falsely humble here. Um, I, I didn't assume that I would ever make a piece that would get into a, a place like the Center for Art and Wood um, and then the fact that it, you know, when it showed up on the cover of the catalog, I, I didn't, I didn't have any contact with Albert prior to that. And this package arrived kind of anonymously in the mail one day, and I, I opened it up and looked at it, and I looked at just the way that I happened to open it. Skip Johnson's piece was on the back cover, and I'm holding this this book in my hand that I didn't know was coming, and I thought, oh, that's a cool piece. And I flipped it over, and there was my stool. I mean. Um, so here I was, you know, a, a nobody in the woodworking world, not that I've launched into international fame since, but I, it's just the idea that, that Albert and, and that whoever was on that team to make those decisions selected my piece, um, it, it took me to a place where I never expected to be. Thank you, Albert. Um, so yeah, so that's a great um, segue to the next question or, that I have, or I'm curious about, um, you know, having your piece in the Center for Art and Wood what does it mean for an artist for you to have a piece 
you know, displayed um, available for all to see to kind of make their own, you know, ideas behind it, kind of just like what I had. Um, like, how do you feel about that? Like, people seeing your piece with you not necessarily knowing that they're seeing it, but it's out there being seen by X amount of people. How does that feel like for you as an artist? Yeah, I, I, I feel like maybe I've already touched on an, an answer to that question. I mean, it's, it's wonderful, you know, it's, it's humbling and, and, um, and, and I'm proud of it, hopefully proud in a good way. Um, you know, especially when I look at the work at the Center for Art and Wood, and I'm genuinely, I truly, I know my heart, I'm not being falsely humble here. When you think that, you know, there's people like, um, I mean, some of my heroes, I mean, my professor from Indiana is, you know, he's not, perhaps not as well known as some others, but his design sense is phenomenal. He's got work in the show, in the, in the collection, Stephen Hogbin, um, you know, I, I, I'm not going to start listing names, but, you know, but to think that, you know, that I'm in a collection with those same heavy hitters, those really geniuses, I believe them to be geniuses. Um, I don't, I, I, you know, I don't see my work like that, but just to have it alongside is, is, is pretty special. Right. Uh, so we have a question here from Carolyn um, about the piece. So did you, Neil, did you have all the materials used uh, in your workshop already or as you're creating the stool or did you need to find some of the materials that you envisioned for it? Um, that's a great question, Carolyn. I, I will answer it um, very honestly. I've never, I've never made anything that I didn't have the stuff like right in front of me. I mean, so if I'm making a, a, a table for my dining room or for a, for a customer, I'm typically saying I, I have a I have a lot of cherry right now let's make it out of cherry and if it's walnut it's walnut so to me um, in this case the, the mahogany for the seat I happen to have a piece and it was really ideal just because the, the grain structure um, does kind of simulate leather a little bit maple for the legs was it was not a critical decision but I, I think it was a nice contrast um, having the lasts that's what those feet are called the last l-a-s-t-s Having the last handy obviously was the inspiration for the piece, but um, I, I, I had everything right there in, within reach. Great. Um, so I also wanted to touch on during this conversation, um, you know, how people's relationships, and I like using that word a lot for when, when it comes to people's um, artworks, the pieces that they create, um, the relationship in the past year just in, uh, during quarantine and isolation and not being able to probably create things you could do or maybe you change things up. Um, but how did your relationship uh, with your art and with wood, how did that change um, in the past year, past few years? Yeah, um, I think I've always been hesitant to do uh, conceptual, um, especially uh, political pieces or social pieces. My goal has usually been whimsy or, um, or beauty, I guess. But um, as I get older, and especially with you know the environment, you know the political environment we've been living through, and certainly COVID, um, I, I couldn't help myself. I mean, I it, I sent you a picture earlier of, of my most recent piece, um, and it, this is um, it's on racism, anti-racism. Um, this is just a photograph I took with my telephone, so it's not a great photograph. You're looking at a 17 inch platter form. Um, there is a, a um, there's a, a leg under it that you can't see in this photograph so that it's tilted up a little bit. Um, if, if you, I think you have a, a, a detail shot, can you show that? Yeah, so these ebony posts um, represent the, the barriers to people of color and, and um, and so that you have this beautifully shine, this, this wood is eucalyptus, beautiful grain. And it's, so one side is varnished and gorgeous. You can see there's the, you can just see part of the green arc that goes the whole way around um, the side of the piece that represents what the haves have in this country. The other piece is unfinished. Um, there's some blood or some red there representing blood. Um, the shadows, if you could show the third piece, you can see the, the longer shadows. Um, John Vahanian actually, Put a hot light on this and and I, I built the piece and then john did more of the decoration um so those shadows that were cast by the by the uh high intensity light bulb um he actually drew onto the piece and um and i he immediately saw jail bars when when he was doing this so so you have you know the two extremes the have and the have nots in this country i've done a series of these pieces um 
I, I'm not happy with my photograph at all. I, I've been had the privilege to work with a guy named Mark Feinstein my whole life, and um, he hasn't shot this piece yet. But um, I, I think that you know, I, I set it up on the lathe so that you wouldn't even have a perfect circle when it's done, as you can see. I, I think that you know, even prior to the George, George Floyd um, murder, you know, I was I was tuned in to um, you know to the injustice in this country, and so my work is really taking some serious turns in that direction. And I hope to, um, I hope to be making statements now with, with my work, you know, until I'm done, no longer able to work. That's a great sneak peek um, into what you plan on creating. It's just, I'm always fascinated by people's um, artists evolution as an artist. Um, even if you're known for something specific, an art idea or material doesn't mean that's what you're stuck in, I think. Um, that's the beauty of art, right? Um, yeah. Always changing. Um, so I think that's all. Neil, thanks again for being part of this. I'm really appreciative. But is there anything, and like I mentioned, I was inspired by um, Peace, um, The Walking Stool. I'm going to share it again, um, just because I think people need to see it again. <laughs> um, but is there anything else, Neil? Um, that you wanted to mention about the walking stool, um, just maybe what it's meant to you for this, this whole time, or just anything about the piece that people, you want people to know? Um, no, I, I, I mean, it's tempting to ramble on and because I could, trust me, I could do this for weeks, but I, I would, I'll, I'll shift the attention to you, Kenneth. I, your questions, and, I, and I, I hope I'm not over flattering here, but your questions are exceptional. I mean, typically um, questions about art are, you know, so far out there that they're impossible to answer, or they're so pragmatic that they're not interesting to answer. Your questions are, are awesome, and I, I compliment yeah. you. Thank you. I did spend five years <laughs> asking people questions, but I think, I don't know, I'm just really, not, not that he's the word passionate, but like, I'm passionate about just like learning about people's art. And um, I covered art and culture as a reporter, and luckily at my job at Enroute, I'm still working with arts and culture organizations and the industry. And so, you know, I'm, I'm just very passionate about that. So thank you, Neil. <laughs> I don't want to, not to be humble as well. Uh, I'm going to be humble also. So uh, <laughs> I don't like hearing that as well. So no, um, I think there was a question uh, from Nava, I think. Um, so I'm just going to say in the chat. So this work is so poetic, especially in its evocation of mending. The positioning of the needle in the seat cushion seems to say that mending is never completed and happens while in a state of motion. Uh, what does the concept of mending mean to you beyond the walking stool and also through it? Oh. I think you're on mute. Oh. Neil, you're muted. We can't hear the genius that is coming out. <laughs> I have to listen. You'll have to listen carefully for the genius. Um, I, I think Nava would do a better job, perhaps, answering that question. Um, I, yeah, I, I, it's. I love the idea that someone can look. No one's ever commented on the on the uh, stitching with the idea of mending, or the fact that it is happening in in motion. That's. It's it's great to do a piece and then hear other people's perceptions of what it means to them. Um, I mean, that's, you know, whether it's an oil painting or, a, or a, that wonderful mug that you just bought, Kenneth, or, or my walking stool, it's, it's really interesting to, to, um, to do a piece and then um, listen to other, I, I mentioned to Kenneth earlier that I did a, I did a chair years ago that um, I thought would be whimsical. It was a rocking chair, but it had tank tracks on it. And it was very much a military um, piece. And I, I thought it would be fun and funny, and it was not received that way. It's the only piece I've ever done that didn't, I mean, not that I, everything I've ever done sold instantly, but most of my work, I'm happy to say, is, is in somebody's home or um, this piece is, is still in my house because it's, it's weird and it's dark and, and um, other people's perception of the piece is very, very different from my intention. It's always fascinating because um... I can relate to that, to that in a way because, so I have a couple of tattoos that I finally told my parents about even though I'm an adult. But um, <laughs> even with tattoos or it's like, even if I had the idea, all, tattoos have to mean something to me. So there's a, I start with an idea first, then I give the artist um, 
the the freedom to do what they will with the piece and then obviously i have a say in like if i like it or not to put it on my body but even if i had the concept first and then like even my relationship with relationship with my tattoos have changed so even if i had an idea of like xyz if i see something if i look at one specific thing it's like oh that also fits the design or the idea and so i always latch additional ideas mm. into that because like okay so my headspace was different back then. So my headspace is this now. And so I'm looking at the tattoo differently now. And so, but it's still the same tattoo, but just how I think about it has changed. And so anyway, enough about me. <laughs> um, no, that's, that's well said. I, I think, you know, when I think about the stool, I, when I would look at it, when it was brand new, I, there were questions in my mind and, and, um, and I, you know, I wasn't really quite sure how to feel about it. I felt like it was a good piece, but I, I didn't have a sense that it would, you know, travel the way that it has. And when I look at it now, it, it's it's kind of become larger than larger than me as an artist. Um, I was emailing with Betty Shapiro, who's a wonderful Turner, um, a couple of years ago, and she didn't know who Neil Donovan was, but she knew the walking stool. And I think that's kind of an example of what I'm talking about. I mean, I I'm I'm a middle of the road Turner and, and artist, and and, and I'm, I'm fine with that. When I think about what my life has been, I've been blessed to do a lot of different things and turning an art is one of them. Um, and to think that one of my pieces is, is out there for, for, you know, and Betty Shapiro's aware of it. That was, that was really cool. So. And so we have a question from Mache. So is the walking stool a kinetic sculpture? Um, no, technically, I, my understanding would be um, Nishé would a, a, a kinetic piece would actually move. This piece stays still and implies motion. Awesome. All right. So, are there any other questions for Neil? I think if people want to unmute themselves and just want to say hi or or have a yeah everybody is welcome to unmute themselves and and speak speak up if you feel inclined to say hello to um neil and kenneth before while you're doing that i just want to thank both of you uh, for a really really wonderful conversation for that kicks us off on our weekend um it was so nutritious and wonderful to hear from you both um, and to hear this dialogue. I really, really enjoyed it and it was worth waiting for. So thank you so much to both of you. Thank you, I love, I miss talking to people. <laughs> and so I just really appreciate it. When Nava, you approached me for this opportunity, I was like, oh, oh my God, <laughs> it was, I was very honored. Um, but thank you for being patient and rescheduling um, understanding so I'm glad it worked out. <laughs> we are very honored to have you both. And I, I will add also that um, it is very rare to have an object lesson where the artist is present also. So this is, this is um, a really exceptional um, event, really. Neil, thank you so much for being a part of this. It's, it's, um, it's just to have the, the presence of the artist to be able to speak in dialogue about the work is so meaningful and so helpful to us. And the fact that we are able to document this brings layers of meaning to the work itself as well. And what the center is allowed to, um, you know, as, as part of our responsibility for works in the collection, um, this becomes a part of that legacy. So thank you. Oh, wow. It's been a privilege. Thank you. Does Neil have a website that is his that if we want to see more of his work, we could see? Um, yeah, I'm on Instagram. <laughs> could... Yeah. Fine. I'm on... I'm on Instagram. Okay. And I think it's, gosh, I should know this. Um, I think it's Neil Donovan Art. Um, and I don't know, Nava, if there's a way that I could, I could post that somehow, because I might not have that. I, I'm guessing there's probably a search feature on, on Instagram. Yep. That's what I'm looking for right now. Yeah. We will, we will add it to the chat so that everybody can link up with I've just I've just found it right here. So oh, cool. I'm in. Um, and the piece that was the the recent piece that was just discussed um, between you and Kenneth um, on races and the Great Divide is um, is beautifully depicted here in your Instagram. Oh, good, good. Thank you. Yeah, and, and I have um, especially during, during especially during COVID, most of those photographs are just um, 
my attempts with my with my iPhone 8. So they're they're not. I mean, there are some prof wonderful professional photos of my work, and some of them not so much. Neil, um, I was just wondering about. Honestly, you're probably the most pragmatic artist I've ever listened to talk about their work because I. I am an artist. I, I'm a painter. I work in digital and analog. And I uh, have gone to, I actually went through the whole art school process, like the, the BA, the MFA, and I just finished, well, I'm in the process of finishing graduate school again, um, mm -hmm. as we speak. And most artists, myself included, have a lot of emotional turmoil and baggage and stuff wrapped up in their art and you're just like oh this was my process I didn't draw it out I just kind of put things together as they occurred to me and I'm like could it be that simple <laughs> it just doesn't feel that way no it's it's not that simple I mean again, I, I touched on it very briefly I mean I try I strive for being pragmatic because nobody wants to hear you know hear my blood sweat and tears stuff but um when I was making walking stool, and, and I remember this 30 years ago, I remember the deep frustration and the roller coaster ride of having the having a piece in progress that I knew was going to be a good piece, but I, I didn't know how to finish it. So when I stumbled upon that third leg as a cane, I'm getting the chills telling you this story. Um, when I stumbled on that, it's it was you know it's an epiphany. It's a, it's you know fireworks in my heart and mind. No, but there's and there, I have pieces in my studio right now that are 90, literally 90 percent finished, but they're not done because I don't know how to finish them. And it's and they mock me when I walk by them in the studio. They make fun of me. They tease me. They challenge me. But I don't I don't have the wherewithal to finish them as much as I would like to. And I even have the time now at this age. I could I could go out right now and finish one if I knew how. So it, it hurts. It sucks. Yeah, that's that's more like it. Thank you. There you go. That's how I feel about a lot of my work. So I understand that's how that's the kind of the conversations I'm used to ha hearing for artists. So it was just really surprising to hear the way you stated things earlier. And I was like, I just really, it, it just caused me to question like, are there artists out there that, that don't have blood, sweat, and tears stories about their work? I, not good artists. Yeah, I, say, I think like um, those artists are mm -hmm. so filled with their own ego that that they're not. I don't know. But yeah, the process is always like it's hard. Yeah, it's really hard. I I I was an educator my whole life, and and I as an administrator at a high school, I took a group of art students to see a local artist who's really talented woman. She's since passed away. But one of the high school students said to her um, during the course of this, you know, this brief um, tour of her studio, she said, don't you just love painting? And the artist, like, um, she almost physically attacked this student. She said, no, I hate it. And she very briefly but concisely, um, I, and I felt really bad for the student because she was naive enough to ask the question. She was very young and didn't have a deep understanding of what we're talking about here. But to watch this, this woman who was being really friendly with these kids suddenly turn on them when she was considering her relationship with her work, it was like, oh, my God, it was hard to watch. She just she exploded, um, not with anger, but with angst. And um, and this little girl was like, you know, a deer in the headlights. And it was it was I'll never forget it. It was just a, a quick glimpse of what's going on in the heart of an artist when they're trying to do good work. That's That's been my experience for the last 20, 25 years. So I, I get it. Yeah, I'm sure you do. Well, if there aren't any other questions, um, I just want to thank everyone for checking in with us this evening and for spending um, this launch to your weekend with us. And I want to um, send a special hello to Patricia's bird. I think this is the first time that I've actually seen Bye. the bird and not just heard the bird. So um, the bird is beautiful. 
So Thank I'm you. very glad to um, have this opportunity to finally. There she is. See you know the her. creature that um, is so large and very opinionated. Um, it's an, and it's wonderful to be joined um, by the bird this, this evening. It's wonderful uh, to have back. It was wonderful to see your familiar surroundings of <laughs> Philadelphia area. Here we are. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you very much, Patricia. Thank you for joining us tonight. Um, Do you mind we, if, I, I, if, you, uh, if I say something a little bit? Um, uh, this is sort of unrelated, but I just want to thank, thank you again to the Center for Art and Wood. Um, I appreciate everything that Center for Art and Wood and other craft makers, organizations, arts and culture organizations, what they do for Philadelphia. Um, because like, as mentioned, I was a reporter covering this industry and I always felt it was such an under appreciated, underrated industry um, when it comes to, you know, grants, federal funding, all of that. I was in the numbers because I wrote about it. And I always told people when I was a reporter that I always felt that arts and culture, just generally people probably imagine it's just fun and games, arts and culture, let's look at the art, it's pretty. They don't realize the 4.1 in Philadelphia, 4.1 billion economic impacts that it touches education, medicine, all the factors that people care about, quote unquote, care about, that the money makers, you know, the industry, eds and meds, arts and culture touches all of that. And I think it's kind of just been something in me that I wanted to just let people know you know as a reporter, even now working with organizations, I just hope that people understand that. <laughs> um, don't want to get too heated, but I just want to let you know that, you know, I see your work, I appreciate it. And I just hope that people see what you and other organizations do for Philadelphia and the region. So that's all I have to say. <laughs> Thank you so much, Kenneth, for that, um, that advocacy and all of the work that you do um, and all the heart you put into it. It's, um, it's uh, wonderful to be in Philadelphia and to work with, um, with all of our colleagues here who are so passionate and invested in the arts and the culture and understand um, the meaning that arts and culture bring to our daily lives. So thank you for that. And thank you for everyone for being here tonight. I wish everyone a wonderful and safe weekend um, and, um, and a wonderful time in the sun. And uh, now that we're out of the storm and um, please come and see us and come and say hello. Thanks everyone. Thanks, thank Neil. You everyone. Thanks, Thanks, thank you, Dennis. Thank you, Neil. Bye. Thank Bye. you so much. Bye. Bye. Take care, Albert. <laughs>